Hello, my name is Dr. Stephen Wilkins. Welcome to this Sussex Universe lecture about exploring the First Light Epoch, the focus of my research. Okay, so first of all, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. Now, since the mid-20th century, we've known that our universe is expanding. A consequence of this is that the early universe was hotter and denser, but also that the universe has a finite age and changes over time. Today, we believe the universe has been around about 14 billion years. Now, we're able to actually see the universe changing over time because of the finite speed of light. So as we look out at distant objects, we don't see them as they appear as they actually are today. We see them as they appear a certain amount of time ago. Okay, so for example, when we look at the moon, we see the moon as it appears about a second ago. Okay, but when we look at this galaxy, for example, we're seeing it as it actually was a few tens of millions of years ago. And we can use this fact to actually probe the entire history of our own universe if we can look far enough away. Okay, so my research concentrates on the very earliest phase of galaxy formation in the universe. So what I'd like to call the first light epoch, so when the first stars and galaxies were formed. But before we go on to that, I'm just going to give you some more background. Okay, one of the really first important events in the universe's history is something called baryongenesis. Now this took place when the universe was a fraction of a second old, and this left the universe being composed of matter in the form of subatomic particles, things like protons and electrons, and also radiation. Okay, now the universe at this time was very very hot, and not really much happened. But over time it expanded and cooled, and eventually, literally a few minutes later, the universe had cooled sufficiently that we could start forming the first light elements, mostly hydrogen and helium. Now these light elements are actually the building blocks of stars, planets, and ultimately us, okay? But there's a few steps in between there. Okay. Now during this time, these atoms, these light elements, were ionised. What that means is, the positively charged nuclei, composed of protons and often neutrons, existed separately from the negatively charged electrons. Okay. Now one consequence of this is that, because light interacts with charged particles, it can't travel very far without being scattered. Essentially the universe at this point was opaque, or a better analogy is maybe that it was foggy. Okay, so for example we've got a picture of Brighton Pier here, in the fog. Now what you can see here is that light can't travel very far without being scattered by, in this case, the water droplets. Now the very very early universe is, is similar, light can't travel very far without being scattered by one of these charged particles. Okay, but we know that this isn't going to last forever. As the universe continued to expand, it cooled and eventually neutral atoms could form and light could travel mostly unimpeded through the universe. Now we can see these photons left over from the early universe today as what we call the cosmic background radiation. This is essentially a snapshot of the universe when it was only a few hundred thousand years old. Okay, So we can see one example of this here from the Planck satellite. And what you're really seeing in this map is the distribution of matter in the universe when the universe was only about 400,000 years old. Now the reds here, that tells us where the universe is more dense than the average, whereas the blues tells us where the universe was less dense. Okay. Now hold on to that fact, because that's important in a second. Now with the continued expansion of the universe, these background photons are shifted into the infrared. I'll talk more about that in a second as well. This ultimately left the universe devoid of any visible light. At this point, we've got no stars or galaxies yet. And we call this period of the universe's history the cosmological dark ages. So it's not the dark ages like this, so maybe the historical European dark ages, dark age, it's the dark ages like this. So a period of the universe is history when the universe was literally dark, okay, where there were no sources of light. But just because the universe was dark doesn't mean that nothing was happening. During this period, these dark ages, which encompassed a few hundred million years, the bits of the universe which are more dense that we see in the cosmic background radiation than the average, they got denser and denser and denser. And this is because they have more gravity than the surroundings, and therefore they attract more material to them. Now, through this process called gravitational instability, you take these little patches of the universe which were slightly more dense, and you make them even more dense over time, and eventually you form these structures. 
Now today, cosmologists are able to use these supercomputer simulations to model this, and you can see one example of this here, this Aquarius simulation, showing the formation of these structures. Now eventually, where you get lots of material together, we think that you can form stars and supermassive black holes, and essentially galaxies. Now these objects, they begin lighting up the universe, so this now becomes the first light epoch. Now one of the important aspects of this period is that these objects produce intense radiation. Okay, this radiation uh, is able to reionize the universe. So if you remember, the very early universe was ionized because it was so hot, then it became neutral. Okay, But now that we've got a new source of energy of ionizing photons, these stars, these galaxies, these supermassive black holes, they can become, begin reionizing the universe. And we think it happens something like this. So you can see here in this schematic, we have the first luminous objects. They produce ionizing photons and they make these bubbles around them. Now over time, these bubbles expand. And as we have more and more sources, eventually these bubbles begin to overlap. And eventually we're able to reionize the entire universe. Okay. But even though the universe has now been reionized, we can still see the light. And that's because unlike the very early universe, this period of the universe's history, the universe has now expanded so much that light can actually travel through this ionized gas without really being affected too much. Now, the other really important thing that happened in the very early universe was the initial enrichment of the universe. So we know that many of the first stars to form subsequently exploded as supernovae. And as they did, they enriched their surroundings and the wider universe with heavy elements. Okay, this is everything heavier than helium, so including carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, etc. Now, the gas enriched with these heavy elements actually goes on to form a new generation of stars, but also rocky terrestrial planets and also life. Okay, so this was a really kind of broad overview of some of the important steps in this first light epoch. So the transition from the Dark Ages, the process of reionization, and the process of enrichment. Okay. And although we kind of understand um, what's broadly going on, there's lots of details that we still don't really know. And so we can list these open questions. How did the first galaxies form and evolve? Okay. Again, we know some of the broad details, but we don't know the specifics. What we really don't know is how did the first supermassive black holes form? We have ideas, but we haven't been able to verify those yet. But what we do know is that we can form very large black holes, millions of times the mass of the sun, within a relatively short period of time. What was the source of the photons responsible for reionization? We think, based on work with Hubble, that this is probably just the stars that are forming the early universe, but there could be something more exotic there as well. And were the first stars different from subsequent generations? Okay. We think they were because they were formed from just hydrogen and helium, but we haven't yet found um, decisive evidence that we found the very first generations of stars, so we haven't been able to say observationally how they really are different. And finally, how was the early universe enriched with heavy elements, and how much of it was locked up into dust? Okay. So, how do we do this? How do we actually observe this period of the universe's history? And how do we answer these questions? Well, to do this, I'm going to step back first of all and just explain how astronomers actually learn about objects, in particular galaxies. Okay, so astronomers are used to looking at the spectra of an object. So all the spectra of an object is, is the amount of light which comes from an object as a function of the wavelength. Okay, so we can see in this diagram here, we've got the spectra of a galaxy, and it extends all the way from the X-rays, so very, very energetic, through the UV and the visible, then the infrared, and then into the radio. And we see that this particular galaxy, it doesn't produce light uniformly across the spectrum. We see these bumps, okay? And in fact, each of these different features tells us something different about the galaxy. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go through each of the different wavelengths and explain where each of the different features comes from. Okay, so starting off on the, the left-hand corner, the X-rays. So the X-rays are very energetic light, and X-rays from galaxies mostly come from very, very hot gas. That gas is millions of degrees, 
okay, and that gas is typically only found around black holes, okay, so black holes are very, very, very dense objects, and they will accrete material from their surroundings, as that material falls towards the black hole, it heats up to these really, really high temperatures, okay. When we look in the UV, what we're really seeing is very hot, massive stars. Now, stars like the Sun, they don't produce very much UV, but we do know there are lots of much larger stars, much more luminous, hotter stars, and they really do produce lots of UV. In fact, they produce a lot more UV than this figure kind of gives credit to, and that's because most of the UV that they actually produce gets absorbed by the surrounding hydrogen and helium and other elements, okay, and gets reprocessed. And I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, we can now look at the visible light. So this is dominated by both normal stars like the Sun, but we also see ionised gas. So the gas here is gas which has been excited or illuminated by all these ionising photons coming from the very hot stars. Now when you excite or illuminate, illuminate this gas, you produce these what we call emission lines. Now by looking at which emission lines we have and how strong they are, you can actually work out what the gas contains. Okay, so this actually allows us to look at a distant galaxy and be able to say that galaxy has got that amount of oxygen or nitrogen or whatever in it. Okay, so this is a really, really useful tool for astronomers to use. If we go into the infrared, okay, we see that what we're now seeing is the dust in the galaxy. Again, this is evidence for heavy elements because dust is mostly made from carbon and iron and other heavy elements. That dust absorbs starlight and it reprocesses it into the infrared. Okay, so we're now seeing the dust glowing in this case. And then if we move into the, the radio, we're typically seeing two things. First of all, we're seeing emission from recent supernovae. Okay, so recent stars that have exploded. They produce this diffuse radio emission coming from galaxies. But we also see some emission lines again. And in this case, you're seeing emission lines not from ionized gas, but cooler gas, so atomic and molecular gas. Okay, so by looking at those emission lines, you can actually work out the total amount of gas which a galaxy contains. Okay, oops. Now, the expansion of the universe causes the wavelength of light emitted from distant galaxies to be stretched. Okay, this is something called cosmological redshift. Now, for galaxies in the early universe, this causes the starlight to be shifted from the UV and visible all the way to the near infrared, something like this. Now, this makes these galaxies very difficult to observe from the ground, and that's because most of the infrared is blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. Now, this is shown in this little figure here. So, what we have on the bottom is the wavelength, and what we have on the left is how much of the light is absorbed by the atmosphere. Now, in the X-rays and the UV, virtually all of the light coming from a distant object is absorbed by our atmosphere. Now, that's good for us humans because X-rays and UV are very, very bad for us. As we go into the visible, we can see that actually most of the light is able to travel through the atmosphere. Okay. As we go into the infrared, it's a little bit more difficult. So some of the light can travel through the atmosphere, but actually most of it gets blocked by the atmosphere. And then as we go into the radio, we can see there's this wide gap where our atmosphere becomes transparent. And this is what enables things like Wi-Fi technology and mobile phones. Okay. So thinking specifically about the very first galaxies, observations of these first galaxies, they're going to lie at the frontier of our capabilities. Okay, so they're, they're the observational frontier of astronomy. Now, one of the reasons for this is that they're intrinsically faint. So we're seeing the youngest galaxies in the universe, or we're looking for the youngest galaxies in the universe. So those galaxies haven't had time to build up large amounts of gas or stars. Okay, Because we're looking at the early universe, we're also looking really far away, which makes them more difficult to find. And we're also seeing the light is shifted into the infrared, which, as I mentioned, makes it impossible to observe them from the ground in most cases. Um, but also much more difficult to observe with normal camera technology as well. Okay, so the observations of, of this period of the universe's history we really rely on, on the state-of-the-art telescopes that we have. And some of these state-of-the-art telescopes are listed here. 
Okay, so we have, for example, Hubble at the top left hand corner. Okay, we have the ground based VLT. So this is um, some of our largest ground based telescopes. And although I said most of the light is blocked by the atmosphere, you can still do some work from the ground. Okay, and then we've got a handful of other telescopes, including this telescope called ALMA, which I'll come back to in a second. But first of all, let's talk about Hubble, because Hubble has played the most important role in our study of this period of the universe's history. Okay, this is one of my favourite pictures of Hubble. You can just about see Hubble in the background here, alongside the Earth and another astronaut. But the, the picture is really framed by this, this astronaut sun shield here. Now with Hubble observations, we've been able to find hundreds of galaxies present in the early universe. We've also been able to measure things like the amount of star formation and the contribution of those galaxies to reionization. Probably one of the most famous images obtained by Hubble is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, or sometimes called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, shown here. This, this one image of, of a really tiny patch of the sky contains thousands of galaxies extending over around 90% of the universe's history. In fact, we can just zoom in on one of these galaxies down here, this little red blob. This is actually a galaxy that we're seeing when the universe was only a few hundred million years old. Okay, so we're kind of using Hubble here almost as a time machine. These galaxies that you can see in this image stretch back over most of the, the, the universe's history. Okay, oops. Okay, so what can we do with Hubble? Well, in fact, Hubble is really limited. So Hubble really wasn't designed to look for these really, really distant galaxies. And so, in fact, all Hubble does is really probe the, the tip of the UV of these galaxies. So it really misses out most of the light produced by these galaxies. Okay. Um, really importantly, this actually limits how far back Hubble can even look. All right. So you can imagine as you go to even higher redshift, even more distant galaxies, this entire spectrum moves to the right, and at some point Hubble is no longer able to even see those galaxies. So in fact, galaxies in the universe, um, when the universe was less than about 500 million years old, Hubble can't see them. Okay. Um, also, Hubble lacks any really sensitive spectroscopic capability, so we can't measure things like the the detailed chemical abundances in those galaxies. And Hubble actually has a really relatively small mirror. It's only about two and a half meters in diameter. And that means that not only can we not see very faint objects, but we can't really obtain nice detailed pictures of objects. So in fact, this one little image that I'm showing you here in the top left hand corner, this is one of the best images that we have of a galaxy in this period of the universe's history. More recently, we've been able to learn more about these galaxies with ALMA. So this is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. This is essentially a radio or submillimeter telescope located in Chile. And this is able to probe the rest frame for infrared emission from these galaxies. Now with ALMA, we've been able to reveal the presence of dust and therefore heavy elements present in the relatively young universe. So really ALMA and Hubble and a handful of other telescopes have allowed us to kind of scratch the surface of the very early universe. But what are we going to learn about in the future? Or what are we going to use in the future? Okay. Well, it turns out the study of the first light epoch is going to benefit enormously from a range of new facilities coming online over the next decade. Probably the first and maybe most important of these is the Webb Telescope, coming hopefully next year in 2021. So unlike Hubble, Webb is actually designed to operate almost solely in the infrared. Okay, so you can see a comparison here of Hubble and Webb. Okay, and you can see that while Hubble probed the UV, the visible, and a little bit of the infrared, Webb is really dedicated to exploring the near and mid infrared. Now, because of this, Webb can actually see not just the rest frame UV, but also the rest frame optical from these galaxies. So it can really see all of the hot stars and the normal stars in these galaxies, stretching back over most of the universe's history. Okay, So really importantly, we'll be able to see these emission lines here and actually tell you what these galaxies actually contain in terms of the elements. Okay. But Webb isn't the only player in the game. There are other new telescopes coming up as well. So one of the next one of these is the Euclid spacecraft, 
This is a, a relatively small visible and infrared space telescope built by the European Space Agency. It's actually got a smaller mirror than Hubble, but it has a very, very large field of view. What that means is it can look over very large areas of sky. So whereas Hubble and Webb, they only look at very small patches of sky, Euclid is able to probe a huge area of sky. But because of its small mirror, it means it won't find very faint distant galaxies, but it might be able to find lots of very bright rare galaxies, even in the very early universe. Okay, And Euclid should be launched around the same time as Webb, it might be delayed about a year afterwards. There's also, very similar to Euclid, is NASA's Roman Space Telescope, what used to be called the Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope. This is about the same size as Hubble, okay, so it's much larger than Euclid, but it kind of has the same job. It's a much wider field, okay, so we're going to find many more, many more bright galaxies over a large area. And that's really important because we want to find not only the very faint galaxies, but also the very bright ones as well to understand how galaxies assemble. We also are building a new generation of ground-based telescopes. Um, the largest of these is the European Extremely Large Telescope. You can see that I've now had to change my diagram to now accommodate the ELT here. So you can see that the ELT really is huge compared to Roman, Webb, Euclid, but even compared to the four VLT telescopes. Okay, so this really is going to be going to be groundbreaking. You can see what the ELT looks like at the moment. So this was a picture taken, I think, about a year ago now. And you can see the this is on top of a mountain in Chile. And you can see the road has now been built. And you can see the foundations are being laid for the telescope. This is what the telescope will eventually look like. So the ELT will have a huge collecting area, providing exquisite spectral and spatial resolution, allowing it to study individual objects in great detail. Okay, so what the ELT is going to be really useful for is, once you've found a very distant galaxy, it will get really precise measurements of that galaxy. But, kind of opposite to Roman and opposite to Euclid, it has a very, very small field of view, limiting its ability to find objects. So, for that reason, it's really synergistic with Webb and other upcoming space facilities. So, whereas Webb, Euclid and Roman will find galaxies, ELT can then go look at them in more detail. Now, we don't just have new visible and infrared telescopes coming up, we've also got a new radio telescope coming up, albeit maybe on a slightly longer time scale. And this is the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA. This is a really ambitious international radio telescope project with significant UK leadership. In fact, the headquarters are based here in the UK, up at the Jodrell Bank Observatory near Manchester. This is actually two separate telescopes today, one of which is going to be based in South Africa, and one based in Australia. And together, they're able to probe much of the radio continuum. Okay, so the radio is a really wide part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is just an artist's visualization. And so you can see that these telescopes are both um, built of lots and lots of independent small telescopes that, when we add them together, allow us to make very, very precise measurements. And again, you can make a diagram like this. So we can see here... Going all the way back to the 1970s, some of the largest uh, radio telescopes as well as some of the largest visible telescopes. And you can see that the largest one that we have at the moment is um, the 500 meter um, spherical telescope, which is based in China. Um, and you can see this compared to both Webb, which appears as a dot, and even the ELT, which is not even built yet. Okay, so you can see that the collecting area of, of radio telescopes is generally much, much larger than is possible for visible uh, and especially space telescopes. And we can add on SKA to this diagram. Okay, so we can see SKA low and SKA mid here. Okay, so we can see these two telescopes added together in the future. Now, what do they tell us? Well, they're radio telescopes, so what they're seeing in the context of first light is actually looking at the radio emission produced by the first supermassive black holes as well as supernovae. Okay, so you can on the left you can see an example of a galaxy with a supermassive black hole. It's a heart. Okay, so there's lots of radio emission coming from the center of that galaxy, but you can also see these jets extending from either side. What we're actually seeing there is the radio emission coming out from here. Okay. And on the right-hand side, we have what's called a supernova remnant, 
This is the leftover remains of a star which has exploded, and again, this produces lots of radio emission that we can potentially probe with SKA. But possibly more excitingly, with SKA we can actually probe a specific wavelength of emission called the 21 centimeter. Now this is this is radio emission produced by atomic hydrogen. Okay, so atomic hydrogen is the most abundant form of hydrogen in the universe, but it's typically very difficult to detect. Okay, but it does produce um, emission at this one particular wavelength or 21 centimeters. Now, by observing galaxies at this wavelength, we can actually map their neutral hydrogen content, which is what you're seeing here. Now, with SKA, SKA is large enough and has the right frequency range that this emission can actually be measured well into the dark ages, okay, when the universe's hydrogen was entirely neutral. So essentially, SKA will be able to produce a map of the universe's hydrogen over the entire dark ages. Okay, so this is really, really exciting. We're now pushing beyond first light and into the dark ages. So although the dark ages are dark in terms of visible light, actually turns out they're not dark in terms of all light. We know that during the dark ages, the neutral hydrogen will produce this 21 centimeter emission that we can in the future detect with SKA. Okay. So this brings me on to my conclusions. So first of all, the epoch of first light is one of the critical periods in the universe's history. Hubble, Alma, and a handful of other facilities have provided us our first glimpse of this first light epoch. And upcoming facilities, and in particular the Webb Telescope, will allow us to explore deep into this epoch, hopefully answering many of the remaining questions. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's talk. Well, we hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, I've got to ask, if you did enjoy it, please give the video a like, and subscribe to our channel to see our future updates. If you're interested in the future talks we've got coming up, do visit our website at bit.ly slash Sussex Universe. And remember, if you're watching live, the live Q&A starts now at the Zoom link in the description down below.